This is a relief model of the British Isles. On the west side of England are uplands and mountains, while on the east are undulating lowlands where the rainfall is moderate. Villages are usually located where a good supply of water is available. There are two kinds of villages. One sprawls along a road, whilst the other is compact in shape. Now, lowland country is essentially agricultural. So in all fertile areas of eastern England, there are many farms. There are consequently many villages where the workers live and where the craftsmen carry on those trades upon which agriculture depends. Some of the villages were built along a road. Others have grown up around a square like this village, which is typical of lowland country and dates back to before the 9th century. Every corner of the village is a reminder of the craftsmen of a bygone age, of the architects and builders of the past. Their work has stood the test of time and mellowed with the years. The carpenters and masons built these houses of timber taken from nearby woodlands and plaster made up from the local chalky clay. Back in the 14th century, these houses were built by Flemish craftsmen who, seeking refuge from religious persecution, settled in England and introduced the weaving trade. This locality was a natural choice for the weaving industry because of its good pasture for the sheep and its proximity to coastal ports. The industry prospered. The wool merchants gave money to the building of a fine church. And cottages were squeezed in everywhere. This industry, however, later gave place to the spinning of fine wools. Various other industries were in turn practiced by the villagers, such as silk weaving, straw plaiting, the manufacture of coconut mats, and horsehair weaving. However, the villagers once more devoted themselves wholeheartedly to agriculture, which had all the while continued to thrive alongside their other industries. Thus, they returned to a livelihood best suited to their environment. Early in the morning, the villagers go off to work on the farm. and the milkman starts his rounds. As regular as clockwork, the postman arrives with the letters, and the children just as punctually go off to school. After they have taken the younger children to school, the mothers and women folk do their shopping. But there's always time for a chat before getting down to the day's housework. On the farms, the horse is starting his work too, for in spite of the increasing use of machines, he is still indispensable for much of the work. The cows have given their morning milk and are on their way back to the fields. But the farmer is out in the fields already, for in late summer and autumn there is the harvesting, and from dawn to dusk the machines are busy. Round and round the reaper clatters, and field after field is cut. And the corn is stacked and thatched. In another field, the sugar beet crop is ready. A type of plough loosens the beet, and the men lift the crops and shake them clean.
the farmer's work varies with the seasons, and winter is the time for hedging and ditching. When spring arrives, there is more ploughing to be done. and the rest of the new season's crops to be sown. Hoeing and singling root crops are part of the summer season's work. Then once again the grain is ripe. So revolves the farmer's calendar, which culminates in harvest. His year will commence again with autumn ploughing. Back in the village, the craftsmen are busy attending to what might be called the farmer's equipment. The wheelwright repairing and making new wheels for the farm wagons. The village blacksmith carries on his trade with hammer, forge and anvil, like his fathers before him, for the horse still needs as many new shoes, and no machine has yet been made to do the job. The saddler builds and renews the horse's harness, for hand-sewn work is still the best. Thus these trades, unchanging with the years, keep alive a tradition of the past while serving the needs of the farmers of today. Yet the village has always been quick to use each new form of progress. Gas was introduced, railways and modernized roads were built, water was piped into the houses, replacing the old system of wells, and electricity has been put to many uses in the present community. These modern appliances and other manufactured goods come from the towns, and to the towns go the agricultural products. Thus, town and country are interdependent. As evening comes down, the horses are turned into the fields and the workers return to their homes. During the centuries, the village has seen many changes, but has survived them all. Industry after industry changed, but the spirit of the villagers remained. Always the land was around them. So they took once more to the land, and with the help of modern science have again reached prosperity. The village is dependent on the land. The workers of the land are dependent on the village. For there they find their supplies. There dwell their craftsmen. And there they foregather in the evenings at the local inn and in true democratic fashion over their glass of beer discuss their politics and air their views, as their forefathers have done for centuries before them. Outside in the fields, night begins to fall, and the hours of rest have come for man and beast. Tomorrow work on the land must go on afresh, for nature has her seasons, and the seasons wait for no man.